Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila from To Love, Honor, and Vacuum, where we like to talk about how to make marriage a passionate adventure and not a giant to-do list. And I'm here with my daughter, Rebecca. Hello. And we are two weeks out of the launch for The Great Sex Rescue, our new book, which is based on our survey of 20,000 women and how different evangelical teachings affected women's marital and sexual satisfaction. And we're so excited. Because, yeah, it's really creeping up and there's a lot to share with you today. A lot of new listeners probably today mm-hmm. on the podcast because I kind of wrote the most viral Twitter thread I've ever done over the weekend on, uh, on how evangelicals see sex. So if you are here, welcome. I'll be talking about that thread later in the yeah. podcast. But we want to start with a new idea that we are debunking. Mm-hmm. Every week leading up to the release of The Great Sex Rescue, we're debunking a new teaching that is prevalent in evangelical circles, but isn't biblical. Yes. We looked at the idea that women were methadone for his porn addiction, like, you know, they need to put out so he doesn't watch porn, how that is toxic, Mm -hmm. how the obligation sex message is toxic. Mm -hmm. And today we want to look at the idea that men are sexual and women are not. Yes. Yes, because God actually created women with a clitoris. Yes. And with the ability to have multiple orgasms. Yep. <laughs> so that should be remembered whenever we're talking about women. But we want to we wanna open with just a number of quotes, which can help us understand why if you're someone who grew up and you never felt sexual, like you just never felt like this was a drive that you had, or you have a difficult time getting excited about sex now, or mm-hmm. you just see it as something dirty because it's all for him. We just want to reassure you that you're not crazy. You probably believe that for good reasons. Yep. And so we just want to read to you just a couple of different quotes. I have a big spreadsheet of these quotes when we were writing The Great Sex Rescue. I was reading all of these evangelical bestsellers and creating a big spreadsheet of problematic things. So we will just read to you some of them. So from Power of a Praying Wife. So after the author spends a while talking about how for women, sex happens because of affection, she then says, but for a husband, sex is pure need. His eyes, ears, brain, and emotions get clouded if he doesn't have that release. And that's contrasting to what she said about women. So she said, this is not the case for women. Mm -hmm. Women need sex because of affection. Men need sex because they just need sex. And that's similar to what Willard Harley said in his needs, her needs. He makes this commitment, meaning marriage, because he trusts her to be as sexually interested in him as he is in her. He trusts her to be sexually available to him whenever he needs to make love and to meet all his sexual needs, just as she trusts him to meet her emotional needs. Yes. And so once again, you're contrasting men and women. Men need sex. Women need emotions, right? Which is exactly what Emerson Egridge says in Love and Respect. If your husband is typical... He has a need you don't have. It's just, I love that he just gets to the point. He just believes that women don't need sex. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to say, sex for him and affection for you is a two-way street. Mm-hmm. Just as he should minister to your spirit to have access to your body, so you too should minister to his body if you want to gain access to his spirit. No, and I will say something where a lot of times authors like Egrich say this kind of thing. And what they mean is if you want him to treat you how you deserve to be treated, if you want to be treated well, first you need to allow him to use your body that is never never okay mm-hmm. it's just not no and it's it's coercion actually yeah, it's it's coercive sex like that actually can very easily turn into an assault situation mm-hmm. here's a great one from the act of marriage a woman never loses the need to be romanced whereas a man doesn't even possess that need his emotions are near the surface and easily ignited hers are deep and burn slowly so in essence women mm-hmm. can't get turned on quickly no. at all and I, I will say and maybe this is too much But whenever you hear authors saying things like women just don't get turned on, women just don't like sex, you know, it takes a lot for women to really even want to be slightly interested in having sex with you. You got to wonder, what experience is he speaking from? Yeah. Like at some point, can we stop listening to sex advice from people whose wives, who talk as if their wives don't want to have sex with them? Yeah. Like this isn't normal. No, no. And I'm not saying that's the case. I'm saying that's what they're portraying it as. They're portraying it as husbands will never have wives who just want to sleep with them. How would they know that? Yeah. You know, at some point we need to believe people when they tell us who they are. Yeah. He also says, young wives may equate their husband's youthful passion with bestiality, not realizing that their husband's drives are not unique, but characteristic of most normal men. Yeah. So men have this insatiable need for sex Mm -hmm. and women don't have anything like that at all. And now let's switch to um, Every Heart Restored, part of the Every Man's Battle series. And one of the authors, Fred, says, our male eyes give us the ability to sin just about any time we want. Yeah. 
And this is highly problematic because it's saying that there's something intrinsic to being male that makes you sin. Yes, and women are phys- are apparently not able to sin. Yes. Our eyes don't even give us the ability to sin. Right. Like men. And the same book, as we talked about last week, says men just don't have that Christian view of sex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I thought this was interesting, too, in Every Heart Restored. As he was talking about male lust, he said that explains why so many men experiment with masturbation early in life. I just thought this was interesting because I think I've seen numbers where something like 75 to 80 percent of boys masturbate, but like so do 50 percent of girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not, even if it's mostly boys, even if a boy has a marginally more like higher likelihood chance based Mm -hmm. on their gender of uh, masturbating it doesn't mean that girls don't and that's what is so interesting is when we look at all this stuff about sexuality it's like all these authors have cherry-picked what they want to pay attention to right it's like oh this fits with our agenda this fits Mm -hmm. with the propaganda that we're promoting about sexuality and so we'll talk about this and we won't even consider what women do I mean again we have to remember that The entire book, Love and Respect, is based on a survey that only asked men if they prefer love or respect. Right. They didn't even ask women. They didn't even ask women. That's what we're seeing over and over and over again. We know that a lot of boys masturbate in high school, so therefore girls must not. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. right we know that boys are visually stimulated therefore girls must not be yeah we know that boys want sex therefore girls must not and no one actually asks the girls right (laughs) and yet when you ask girls you actually get quite similar responses but what happens if you grow up hearing he has a need you don't have Mm -hmm. guys sexuality will totally surprise women because they won't be expecting it they won't understand it girls don't want it in the same way what happens well there was a parenting book out a couple of years ago, and I forget the title, but it was something about how French kids eat anything. Yes. It was this American author who was living in France and she was noticing how French kids will eat anything. Yeah. And American kids tend to eat like chicken fingers and cheese. Yes. And maybe that's why we have constipation in North America. But anyway, (laughs) seriously, like my husband's a pediatrician, one of the biggest consults for constipation. But that's beside the point. The point I was trying to make is that her conclusion was that French parents didn't treat certain foods as children's foods foods and certain foods as adult foods, they just treated food like food. Mm -hmm. And so they made the assumption that kids will like broccoli. Yes. And lo and behold, what happened? Kids like broccoli. Exactly. Often in North America, we make the assumption that kids do not like certain foods. And so we have to like bribe our kids to eat them. Yes. Now, I don't want to turn this into a parenting show. No, totally. (laughs) But I just thought that was interesting, that there is an idea where if you tell kids you aren't going to like this, or you present it in a way that you probably won't like this, and I'm going to have to bribe you, Mm -hmm. but then you'll get something you really do like... Should we be surprised when kids don't like it? Exactly. If you're if you're giving your kids all these messages that you're not going to like this, this isn't really for you, there's something better coming, and then they have the broccoli on their plate, they're going to think, ew, this is not great. Yeah, this is yucky. And so why should we be surprised if we have told women their whole lives, you don't really want sex, mm-hmm. and your husband needs it in a way that you will never understand. What you really need is emotional connection, and that's really the only thing you crave. Mm-hmm. Should we be surprised? surprised when women don't have as high libidos and when women don't necessarily enjoy sex as much. Yeah, exactly. Because sexuality is something that can be fostered, but Mm -hmm. it can also something that can be turned off. And remember, we're telling men these same messages too. And so what happens? Let's turn to our research segment on the podcast. And we have some numbers to share with you from our surveys. So we surveyed 20,000 women for our book, The Great Sex Rescue. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Sorry. That was my cue to hold up the book. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see this. But if you aren't, I am holding up the physical book, The Great Sex Rescue. (laughs) And you can pre-order it at Baker Books for only $10.19 right now. The free shipping. So we will put a link. It sounds so pretty. Yes. (laughs) Flipping through the pages. Um, And you can also pre-order it on Amazon. The price is dropping because more and more people have pre-ordered it. It's doing really well. And if you pre-order, send us your receipt. We have some goodies for you. We will put a link to that in the podcast description as well. But we have some cool research. So what happens when men and women grow up hearing that women don't really like sex and men do? Mm -hmm. In our surveys of men, we asked men, do you prioritize your wife's sexual pleasure? Your wife's sexual pleasure. Of men whose wives do frequently orgasm, Mm -hmm. okay, 99.3% say, yes, I do. Yes. And that would make sense. Your wife frequently orgasms. So, So, way to go. (laughs) Now, if your wife doesn't frequently orgasm, 
Yeah. So if your wife is not reaching orgasm. At least half the time. Yeah. Okay. Then how many men say they prioritize their wife's sexual pleasure? It's less. It's less, but not very much not less. Not very much. 90.6% of men think they prioritize their wife's sexual pleasure, even if their wife is not reaching orgasm frequently. So their wife is not reaching orgasm that often, and yet they think they're prioritizing sexual pleasure. Yeah. To take it even further, 94.1% of men whose wives frequently orgasm say they do enough foreplay. Which again, makes total sense. Because hey, like what is enough? Enough is she orgasms. Exactly. So way to go guys. Yeah. But among men whose wives do not frequently orgasm, 70.6% still say they do enough foreplay. Yeah. And the, what I find interesting there is that you look at the men whose wives infrequently orgasm and more men say that they make their wives pleasure priority than who say they do enough foreplay. Mm -hmm. Which means like, well, if you make your wife's pleasure priority and you don't believe you're doing enough foreplay, what's happening? Yeah. Like what exactly do you think making your wife's pleasure priority looks like? Mm -hmm. And so this is a problem because if 70.6% of men say they're doing enough foreplay, but their wife... Isn't, isn't orgasming. orgasming. Could the problem be that we don't actually expect women to orgasm? Yeah, because when you say that you could do enough foreplay, but you don't get the results that you wanted. Yeah. Right? Like, if I say, if I work five hours, I will have enough money to buy this present. Mm -hmm. And then I only work three hours. I don't then say I have enough money to buy the present. Because yes. my metric is I get the present. Right. Right? But if my mm. metric is just, eh, maybe I get a little close. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or, yeah, I tried. Yeah, so right? what is the metric that they are using because they're not using her orgasm? Yeah, and that's the problem is we need to stop seeing sexuality as something that women sometimes like but most don't because mm -hmm. then it allows us to be in marriages where, you know, you can just kind of say that you tried or really think that you tried, but even if she doesn't orgasm, you can still say, well, I did my part. Mm -hmm. And that might sound a little bit harsh because I know there are a lot of guys out there who get comments who say, listen, I would love to do more foreplay. I would love to make my wife feel awesome in bed, but she won't let me. Yes. And so you know? we know there are people like that out there and, yes. and we'll, we'll talk to you in just a minute. But first, what about women? Yes. So we ask the same questions of women. So of women who frequently orgasm, 94.7% say that their husbands make their pleasure a priority. Awesome. Awesome. Way to go. Men exactly what we would expect. Yes. But if they don't frequently orgasm, 65.1% still say that he mm -hmm. makes their pleasure a priority. And I do want to say there that remember, I know we get a lot of comments from men who say that they really wish that their wives would let them. Mm -hmm. But we have a huge discrepancy between for women who don't orgasm, 90% of husbands say that they prioritize her pleasure, whereas only 65% of the women say that he does. Yes. So remember, if your wife is not orgasming and you think that you're doing everything that you can, talk to her. Mm -hmm. See what she actually says, how she actually feels. Because mm -hmm. this might be a miscommunication. Mm -hmm. You might have different expectations or you may not truly be understanding how she's experiencing this. So yeah. just make sure to be honest about this. Okay, now let's turn to the foreplay question. Yes. Of women who frequently orgasm, 87.6% say that he does enough foreplay. Yep, which again, pretty high number. Pretty good. Yep. yep. If they infrequently orgasm though, 52%. Yes. say he does enough foreplay. So still half of women who do not orgasm says their husbands do enough foreplay. So again, we have to ask the question, what is the metric that they are working towards? Exactly. Because if you say he does enough, you mean enough for what? Yes. <laughs> he, enough as in I don't need anymore, I don't want anymore, I'm not expecting to orgasm. And what we think is going on is that a lot of women do not expect to reach orgasm. Yeah, and so they want their husbands to do just enough foreplay so that they feel, well, at least he tried. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, he does enough because at least he tried. And again, this is a really common feeling and that a lot of women feel like our bodies are broken because mm -hmm. we take so long to reach orgasm because what we have what we have done is we've seen sex from a male point of view. He only needs intercourse. He he reaches climax really quickly. What's wrong with me that my body doesn't respond like his does? Exactly. And I and now before we go any further, we do need to say there are a lot of women who are very satisfied with their sex lives, who are very happy and mm -hmm. who are not orgasming. That's right. You know? And we don't want to add shame if that is your story. If mm -hmm. you are truly happy, if you're thrilled with your marriage <laughs> and you know, you're you're in this situation where sex makes you feel empowered, makes you feel like a woman, it makes you feel sexy, and you just haven't figured out how to get over the edge yeah. yet. But you honestly enjoy sex. Yeah, makes you feel close to your husband. Makes you feel close, you yeah. feel loved and cherished. We're not here to tell you that you're doing it wrong. You know, you keep doing whatever works for you guys, okay? Mm -hmm. Same thing, if you're in a stage of life right now where orgasm just isn't happening, like maybe you just had twins, yeah. you know, and you're just exhausted and sex is the only thing that makes you feel like a woman. 
you right. know? And your body, the hormones, with breastfeeding two kids at once, just not going to let you get there right now. That's also not what we're talking about. But mm-hmm. what we have seen a lot of is we get comments from women who will say things on our posts about how, like, you know, your orgasm matters and her pleasure matters too. But we get these women who come in, they say, I've been married for more than 20 years and I've never had an orgasm. And I can't believe the selfishness of all these women. Don't you know that your job, you need to just learn how to be satisfied and making mm-hmm. your husband satisfied. Yeah. Like marriages are bad if you're both trying to focus on what you need all the time. You need to just learn to just live without this because you know I've learned how to transcend yes and they and they're very proud of themselves they see them very holier because they don't work for their own pleasure because they see sex is entirely for him and you know it doesn't make you holier to not enjoy something that God gave you to enjoy yeah exactly that's what you know Paul talks about that in his letters right where the weaker brother has extra rules for themselves the weaker brother often you Mm -hmm. know puts extra restrictions and stuff to prove to themselves that they are holy and it's like you know what We're not going to say you have to go against your convictions, of course, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, you have freedom to enjoy the gifts of God. Yeah. And how many of these women who aren't expecting to orgasm, who think there's enough foreplay, really just don't prioritize their own pleasure because they don't think they deserve it or they don't think it's, it's even necessary. And what I wonder is how many of these women who are happy now, what happens in eight years? Yeah. What happens in 10 years when... All of a sudden, you know, okay, year two, three of marriage, if, you know, sexual mm-hmm. pleasure isn't really that work, you're like, well, we'll, we'll work it out. And I'm just, you still are in that kind of new married phase. What happens 15 years in the future when you look back and you've just never really felt like sex is for you? Yeah. You know, you've never experienced just feeling like a sexual being. Yeah, and that's part of the issue is that if you grow up hearing that sex is not for you, then when you first get married and when sex isn't working super well, you might think, well, I shouldn't speak up because it's never going to work anyway. It's mostly for my husband. And so these women stay silent. And then decades later, they just can't stand sex anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to change this. I really do think it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're struggling with orgasm or if you're a guy who really wants to bring his wife to orgasm and she won't let you, we have... The orgasm course, which talks about all the different elements that go into her orgasm, often all we focus on is clitoral stimulation, (laughs) and there's so much more to it than that. There's there's sorting out her head, there's sorting out her expectations about sex, so that course can really help, as can the great sex rescue, because I truly believe a lot of things that are keeping women back from sex is the way that we look at sex. So pick up that book. We now want to look at how other cultures have seen this because it's often assumed that biologically women just don't want sex. That's that we're created that way. And that's what all of our evangelical books have told us that men want sex because they're created to want sex. Women are not created to want sex. But interestingly, when you look at other cultures, that's not what we see. So I am pleased to welcome Rabbi Shlomo Slatkin onto the podcast. Welcome. It's so great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. So I, every time I tweet about how we often believe that women have no libido and that it's always women who are the ones who don't want sex, I inevitably get somebody tweeting back that that is not actually the Orthodox Jewish view of it. In other faith traditions, women are not seen as being asexual. So I just thought, you know what, I really want to explore this more. So I thought I would have you on because we've talked before behind the scenes about different things that we're doing and you know what you're talking about. So I would just love to get your take on it. Like what is, what's the Jewish view of women's libido or sexuality or anything like that? Sure. So, I mean, you know, we know with just, you know, coming from the clinical lens as a professional counselor, marriage counselor, Obviously, there are different reasons why people might not have a strong libido, um, mm-hmm. you're having children or you're, you know, thyroid issues or a lot of things that can be go, go depression, there are a lot of things that could be contributing to that. But the, the idea that a woman has no interest in intimacy and no desire, and it's just this, you know, lust, lustful man, you know, is not necessarily accurate in terms of from you know, the Jew, traditional Jewish perspective, with how the Bible and then, of course, the uh, rabbinic codes v- view it. We start off basically. There's the source for all of this is there's a com- positive commandment that a husband is supposed to provide for his wife. He's supposed to clothe her. He's supposed to feed her, um, and he's supposed to be able to provide for her, her. You know, conjugal rights. Meaning, the husband has a duty to meet the woman's desire. 
Now, the things about in terms of modesty and what's considered appropriate of a woman supposed to ask for it, that's not necessarily, that's frowned upon. But in terms of a woman's, it's a woman's right and it's a man's duty to fulfill that right. And we can find- And, a, where, and sir, where is where this that? found? So this is in Exodus 21.10. So it's, the okay. verse there talks about if a person wants to sell their daughter as, as a maid servant, um, so it talks about all the laws of of servants, and this is different than this is not what we think of sl- slavery here. This is a different. This is a, a maid servant. I, I mean, there's a whole lot, another uh, topic to talk about what that means and all the parameters. But the point is, if yeah. you sell your daughter that, and if the person purchases your, your daughter as a maid servant, then he wants to buy, purchase another, marry someone else in addition to her. So in that context, he is not allowed to decrease the food, the clothing, and the conjugal rights of his previous wife, meaning the first, the maidservant. So mm-hmm. if you see that by the maidservant, you're, you're not allowed to decrease those rights. So all the more so by your, the wife that you actually want to marry or your full, <laughs> your full blown wife, um, you know, you're going to be obligated to provide those needs. So it's really a duty. And, you know, we take it very seriously as, as Orthodox Jews is whatever the, we find that the Bible says is a, as a positive commandment, that's an obligation that we have to do. It's not just a nice thing or, you know, if we, we can right. we do it, we're obligated to do it. And there are consequences if we don't do it. So it's our duty or the man's duty to provide those needs and then the woman's right to, to have it. Um, so it's interesting. So it's not about sex. It's more about what the man has to do for the woman as opposed to woman having to meet the husband's needs. That's really interesting because, you know, one of the problems that I'm trying to confront about the way that often the evangelical church has looked at sex is that it is seen as an obligation that the woman owes the man. So this is, this is really, it's flipped. So right. if it's flipped, then it's assumed that she's actually going to want sex then, that she, right. that she sees sex as a positive thing. Of course. Yeah. If she doesn't, it's a need, just like a person needs to be clothed, they need to be fed. They also need to have intimacy. So it's not mm-hmm. that we just have to do it because you want to do it. Now, there's another component in terms of marriage where there's, a, there's another commandment, the first commandment in the Bible of be fruitful and multiply that we're obligated to procreate. And so there's always the question, is the purpose of intimacy to have children or is it to make, give your wife pleasure and get, meet her needs? And it's both because even in cases, mm-hmm. let's say if a woman's pregnant, so you can't, you're not exempt from intimacy for nine months. Or if a woman can't have children, you're not exempt from intimacy. There's still an obligation for, for a man. And this is in the, in the Jewish marriage contract, which is you know, detailed in the Talmud and the, in the Jewish code of law, that it's, it's part of the obligation that if you're, and, and if a man does not meet that obligation, if the woman is, wants it to be met and the man will not meet it, then that's grounds for divorce now. And he owes her um, whatever money he owes her as part of the marriage contract. Now, if she consents and says, you know, I don't want, I don't want it. That's a different story. But if she, if she wants it and he refuses to do it, uh, that's grounds for divorce. He cannot marry. You can't marry someone with the condition. I'm going to marry you um, in order to have a celibate relationship. Um, That's not a valid marriage. Now there is a, there is a concept. I mean, not to, I don't want to make it look like it's it's completely opposite. There is a concept um, in rabbinic law where they do talk about uh, what happens if a woman refuses mm-hmm. to be intimate with her husband? Um, there is an issue, you know, it is a, an issue and it's, a, it's problematic. It's, it's seen as, this is part of the relationship. It's a two-way street. Both people need to meet each other's needs. A man's obligation is a little bit more of a, it's an actual positive commandment where a woman's is not necessarily a positive commandment, but it's, it's a given kind of in, in the context of marriage that a woman is not going to rebel against her husband in that sense and not, and not want to meet her needs. On the other hand, though, she can't it can't be against her will it has to be consensual so she's her needs are always kind of taking precedence in the sense that you know if the husband wants to be intimate the woman doesn't want to you know he cannot do it against her will so Um, would this have been is this is this like a new way of seeing this because i I, forgive me i'm really ignorant about (laughs) you know the the evolution of orthodox sure. judaism or is this kind of like a traditional view which would have been which would have been true in 400 bc etc right so some of these things there can be hints to in the actual bible itself but you know in terms of what we have i mean in judaism we believe that the oral tradition which is recorded in the talmud that it goes back to the time of moses that it was also given mm-hmm. from god not just uh not just the bible but the oral torah as we call it um but I can say the things I'm telling you right now are things that you'll see they're written 2000, you know, almost 2000 years ago in the, in the Mishnah and the Talmud. Uh, and then of course codified 
in the, I would say the mi middle ages. It could be, okay. but I mean, you see this, it's written about, it's not something that, you know, this is like modern, like, you know, 20th century uh, you know, <laughs> women's lib right. or something like that. I mean, there are elements of the community that might want to kind of push the, the envelope in terms of, you know, women's issues. But um, we see that if you really study the text and you really look at what, how the rabbis viewed it traditionally, you're talking about, you know, thousands, 2000 years ago, at least, and from the Bible, you know, it's not this misogynistic kind of, I mean, there might, look, there could be things you have to answer, every, things, every question is a specific question, but there's always, and, you know, I find the great thing about, at least from my perspective, is that there's always answers to the question. You can always find, there's no question I find that's like ever like a stumping question, like, oh, this right. is stump, stumps me, there's no way we can answer it. There's usually an answer for it. But we see that thousands of years ago, you see this concept, and I mean, you even see it in the Bible, in Genesis, the story with Reuben, when he bought the mandrakes from Rachel and sold them to Leah, so his mother could have, as an aphrodisiac, um, so that Jacob could spend the night with his wife, Leah, as opposed to the sister, Rachel. So you see right. that, there, you know, the husband had to give time for each wife and had to de devote himself to her and give, meet her needs. Um, right. So this is something that we see, you know, for thousands of years plus. Um, so it's okay, not a new, so it's not an, it's not a new thing. It's not a woman's lib or any. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting because I do think that there's been a difference in the way that's often been interpreted in in my faith tradition. So it's good to hear that there is another way of looking at the Old Testament scriptures and seeing that God really did care for women, which is which is awesome, which I believe. Now you, let's just, I just, I just want our listeners to know what you do because I, I'm putting you on the spot here and I'm talking to you as a rabbi, but actually what you spend most of your life doing is, is marriage counseling, not necessarily, I mean, you certainly let faith inform it, but it's not, faith isn't the main part of your marriage counseling. Right. And I know when we were, when we were talking a while ago, you were telling me about a great uh, marriage retreat that you and your wife do together. Do you want to just tell our listeners a little sure. bit about so, that? Yeah. So I practice what's called a therapy and I find it to be very much in tune with spirituality. And, and, you know, when I work with couples, it's funny, I, people come to me because they want non-religious marriage retreats. People come to me because they want religious marriage retreats. It's really, it's going to get everybody. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that we have, we do something called the getting a love you want workshop. It's a group workshop that we do together. So now we're doing these re retreats online due to COVID. I hope that we'll be opening up soon in person. And we also travel to do them, but it's the idea that it's a great experience because couples get to see what, you know, the reality of relationship and kind of understand why God brings us together with our spouse, why we, why we uniquely have the struggles that we have and how they're really an opportunity and a blessing in disguise and opportunity for growth and healing. So it's a very holistic approach. I find it to be very much in touch with spirituality and, and you know, our traditional family values of, of what a marriage is about and about the importance of marriage and the sanctity of marriage and, and working things through and, and, and having, a, you know, a safe and loving home environment for the couple and for the family. Um, and we also do these privately. So we have like, if a couple doesn't want to be in a group, most of the time, you know, in terms of what I'm doing every, every day, uh, that's more like quarterly, but every day it's, you know, doing these private retreats with couples, working with a couple and really understanding their history, understanding what the challenges are and seeing the, I'd say almost like the divine providence in the challenges. Because when you start looking at the issues and you start realizing it's not just a coincidence that you met this person that you have this particular issue. The very thing that you need from your spouse is the hardest thing for mm -hmm. them to give. The very thing that you need to heal your own personal challenges and wounds from childhood. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a really amazing experience. And people really feel like that, almost like the presence of God there in, in the process because it's so healing and oh, so powerful. Awesome. Okay, well, I will put the link to that um, in the podcast description sure. for this podcast, and they can check that out. It's Imago, right? That's what you it's said. Imago. Imago therapy, yeah. And we're, our website's called the Marriage Restoration Project. Marriage, Marriage Restoration yeah. Project. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. I really My appreciate pleasure. this. It's so great to get a different perspective, and because you know our scriptures are used by so many different faith traditions, and it's great to see how other how it informs other people too to give us a wider um, perspective and to know that we're not the only ones looking at this stuff. So thank you so. Much. Much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Super interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we see that in other places too, in the Canterbury Tales. Yeah. In the Canterbury Tales, women are shown as just sexually um, ravenous. Yes. And like men, there's a man who's scared he won't be able to live up to the sexual desires of, of this his, woman. Of his youthful wife. Or even in the song, like in Song of Solomon, everything is two ways. Yeah. She wants him. And even, yeah. the, and he even wants her, she wants him. Even the Proverbs, you know, warning against the 
temptress. Yeah. It's it's not saying there's going to be women walking around nearly naked. Yeah, it's not like with the Shanti Felton letter to our teenage daughters, where it's like you as a 14-year-old may accidentally wear a spaghetti strap tank top and then your friend's Cause dad won't lust. be able to not picture no, you naked. No, it's about women on the corners calling him into their beds. Yeah. You know, it's like Potiphar's wife yeah. and Joseph. Like, like we see this in, in multiple cultures. In, um, in Roman culture, it was the same way. It was, it was often assumed that... Women were very sexual. Yeah. And so this is a relatively new thing, this assumption that it's women who have no libido, mm-hmm. and it really is affecting us. So this weekend, huge viral thread. What I was commenting on was actually something quite sad. So uh, for those of you who may not know, late last week, the Ravi Zacharias report came out showing that he was involved in multiple abusive sexual relationships, including some of the ones that we already knew about, but also including, it looks like he was actually involved in sex trafficking, bringing women over, vulnerable women over from um, the Far East and using them as massage therapists. And it looks like he, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but he had apartments that he was keeping in some cities in the Far East where it looks like he was putting up massage therapists. And that's, yeah. that's highly problematic. Problematic. And that's to say it yeah. nicely. I wrote a Twitter thread and I said, you know, we talk about Ravi Zacharias and we talk about the Carl Lentz scandal, who's the Hillsong pastor who just had sex with a whole lot of people and it came yeah. out. Probably there was some clergy sexual abuse there too. I know that the one affair was with someone outside of his church. But anyway, I don't, I don't know all the details, but he was defrocked or whatever you want to call it. And I said, you know, we're, we, we frame this as a celebrity pastor issue. Like mm-hmm. the reason that there's so much sex abuse in the church is because we have celebrity pastors. But what I said is what if it's the evangelical view of sex? Yeah. I just simply listed all kinds of quotes that show that in the evangelical world, we talk about sex as a need that men have that women don't. Something that men have no choice but to take from women. Yeah. Something that where men have naturally have a sinful view of sex. They mm-hmm. can't have the Christian view of sex. They sin simply because they're male and thus women are the ones who need to stop them from sinning Mm -hmm. we gave you a lot of those quotes last week in the podcast (laughs) but this whole idea that that if men don't get enough sex they will become predators yes in essence yeah like the (laughs) like the willard harley quote where i feel like i am even raping my wife because she won't have sex with me there it's just bad and and so if this is the way that we are talking about sex should we not be surprised Mm mm-hmm when people act out in ways that are exactly like that. Yeah, and like we were talking about with the libido issue, the problem is that we've created a self-fulfilling prophecy once again by removing cognitive dissonance with sexual sin. Yeah, now let me read you, let me read you a, um, a Twitter, a Twitter tweet. Let me read you a Twitter tweet by Owen Strawn, who is uh, quite high up in many evangelical fundamentalist circles. Mm-hmm. And he said this after the Ravi Zacharias scandal. An unbeliever reads about an awful scandal and thinks that person is so awful. I hate people like that. A Christian reads about an awful scandal and thinks that could easily be me. God be merciful to me. And he had easily in all caps. And I just want to say, I don't tend to read stuff about people victimizing others and sex trafficking and thinking I could easily go there too. Like, I don't watch true crime documentaries and think, yeah, I am one misstep away from murdering everyone. Like, (laughs) no! There are some things that are beyond the pale. There are some things that are due to a sinful nature. And there are some things that are due to a hardened, wicked heart. And sex trafficking multiple women... And being a perpetual abuser and a, like, rapist, that is not the same thing as, like, you know, struggling with sexual temptation in a dating relationship. Yeah, a struggling in general. And so why is it that he would say that? Yeah. And I'm going to be honest. When I see leaders talk like this, I wonder what's in your past. Yeah, because I could not go to a church that was pastored by someone who, when they heard about a man who abused multiple women, said, oh, that could easily have been me. Yeah, because if that could easily be you, you're not a safe person. The same way that we shouldn't be marrying men who hear stories of, like, you know, pedophiles and think, oh, well, he'd be a good dad because any of us could be a pedophile. No. It's like, no, don't marry the guy who struggles with pedophilia. Yeah. Or who says, I could be a pedophile if it weren't for the grace of God. It's like, um... Let's be careful here, Mm -hmm. you know, because I believe, yes, we are all sinners. Of Mm -hmm. course we are. But we are not all absolutely wicked in the terms of an abuser. 
Yeah. Because when you look at the secular world who doesn't know God, it's not that 100% of people are abusers. No, exactly. And Jesus himself says that there are different levels of sin and different levels of punishment. Like he says, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck. Mm -hmm. Like that is not normal. Not everybody is going around trying to cause little ones to stumble. No. And, and he, that is the point that he is making is that not every sin is the same. And I mean, the Old Testament is, is so adamant that when we oppress people, yeah. <laughs> that major punishment is coming upon us. Like God gets really upset when people oppress others. And when people hurt little ones, he gets really upset. And so this idea that just because we're all sinners means we could all be committing any sin has no idea of like the sanctification of Jesus in our lives. Like, But not only that, it really minimizes what abuse victims and what rape victims, what sex mm -hmm. trafficking victims go through. Yeah. Because if your like average Joe at church could be a sex trafficker, then in essence, what they're going through is minimized because no, your average Joe is not going to be a sex trafficker. It is someone who is truly evil, who mm -hmm. is going to buy and use a person. Yeah. And so we need to be careful not to sin level when we talk about these things and we need to have a nuanced conversation where yes, all of us sin, but we need to recognize that hardening your heart and having a wicked heart that truly is mm -hmm. evil in his intentions towards people is different than simply being a sinner like we all are. Yes. And that does not limit the message of the gospel or our need for Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? So exactly. that's just all we're going to say on that is we're yeah. not saying we're not sinners. We're not saying that some people need Jesus more than others. We're just saying that, mm -hmm. no, we're not all one step away from literally sex trafficking. And mm -hmm. if you think you are, please step down from leadership because you are not a safe person. Yeah. And this is the problem. And this is what I was trying to get at in my thread. And some people are criticizing me saying, but the secular world says all of this stuff too. And the secular world lusts as well. And I would agree. The yeah. secular world does, but there's a big difference. And our big difference is that the leaders in the secular world, whether it be academia or journalism or the human resources department of your corporations or whatever, they all say, hey, you're not allowed to sexually harass. Yeah. And hey, you've got to respect women. And also let's remember that the leaders in non-evangelical Christian circles are doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of circles of Christianity and there's a lot of churches in evangelicalism that are also saying healthy things. It's yeah. just that the majority of evangelical, like, Heads mm -hmm. are not. And by, by heads, what you mean is the authors of these bestsellers, yeah. like our best sellers have consistently said, lust is normal. We need to normalize it. Emerson Egbert says, women, you need to understand his struggle. Mm -hmm. Like this is a normal thing. And the only way to, around it is for women to be methadone. Yeah. In the evangelical world, we hear very different things from the secular world. So even if the, the average Joe mm -hmm. at a bar lusts after women and thinks it's okay to demean women, the fact is that the... The teaching in the secular world is to say that's wrong. Yes. But the teaching in the evangelical world is to say that's just the way men are. And that's exactly what Owen Strawn did in that tweet. Yeah. And that's what I mean by it removes cognitive dissonance. So what happens is we all have a sense of self, right? Like if I think of myself, I am someone who is honest. I would never cheat on a test. Mm -hmm. And then I go to university and I cheat on a test because I'm stressed out and I didn't study enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have inner turmoil because I'm like, that's not who I am. My mm -hmm. behaviors are not in line with my beliefs and my idea of self, mm -hmm. my sense of self. That's called mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance, right? Yeah. So what happens usually when we have cognitive dissonance is you do one of two things. Either you say, I did something wrong and I'm not going to do that again. Right. And you say, the thing that I did was not indicative of who I am. I did something bad. Or you change your sense of self so that it fits with what you did. We're like, well, it's not that I'm dishonest. I could have gotten a better grade. It's just that because of my other classes that are more important and the time I spent studying there, I wasn't able to study enough here. So it's because I am an honest student overall that I just had to take this one little thing. Everyone does it. Mm -hmm. Everyone does it at least once. So if I didn't do it, then I'd be putting myself at a disadvantage because everyone around here cheats. Right. So that's just what students do. Right. So this is okay. It's kind of, it's kind of kosher because all students do it. Yeah. That's what happens. That's how people resolve cognitive dissonance. Either you say, that was a problem. I should really deal with the consequences. I shouldn't do that again. Mm -hmm. Or you say, well, everyone kind of does it. So I'm going to try not to do it again, but it's not that big a deal. And that's how you live with yourself. Yes. So what's happened in the Christian world is we told people that men just sexually sin. 
Mm -hmm. That's what men do. And so then when you're a teenager and you start getting really lured in by porn, Mm -hmm. you don't have the same amount of cognitive dissonance. You may feel a little bit of shame or guilt, but it doesn't go against your sense of self because you're like, well, no, I'm just a Christian man. Yeah. And this is, this is my thorn in my side. This is my messenger of Satan as a Christian man, but it's also kind of expected that you'll do it. Mm -hmm. And so then every little thing that happens, like if you pressure a girl to go too far when you're dating, well, you have Shanti Feldman's book there in your ear telling you that boys feel little ability and little responsibility to stop the sexual progression. And you have like, you know, frankly, again, Shanti's book saying if a girl is wearing something, you have a biological response that you can't help. Yeah. You know, so we have all these things that have systematically broken down cognitive dissonance that's actually protecting people from sexual sin. And it, what it does is it gets in between the Holy Spirit's conviction mm-hmm. and behavioral change and transformation in Christ. So instead of telling boys, hey, that is not all right. You should not be treating women that way. You should not be thinking mm-hmm. about girls that way. You mm-hmm. should not be watching pornography. Like, and this should not be something that, that um, is a part of your life. What we've told them systematically is ignore that disillusionment because this is just part of your self-identity. And so when these things happen, you'll feel some guilt and shame, but that's okay because it's just part of who you are. Yeah, because that's part of what it is to be male. Yep. And one day you'll get married and she can be your methadone. Exactly. And so we need to get rid of this so that, frankly, we have cognitive dissonance. When you think, I'm a good person, good Mm -hmm. people don't sexually assault others, even in very, very, like, gray, nuanced ways, which is what usually happens in date rape situations in high school. Yeah. You know, like, no matter what, good people do not coerce people into sex, even if she was, you know, doing things that my Christian evangelical books said probably makes it less my fault, which is never true. Right. You know, unless we get rid of those messages, we're going to keep getting in the way of our young people, both men and women, learning their true identity Mm -hmm. and learning about an actual healthy sexual ethic because we're replacing the conviction of the Holy Spirit through like this cognitive dissonance kind of feeling. We're Mm -hmm. replacing it with rationalization. Yeah, which is just wrong. And so again, self-fulfilling prophecy there. (laughs) A lot of men get into sexual sin because they're told that's just what you do as a man. So we have a reader question. Again, about a self-fulfilling prophecy, but in a different way this time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And this is why we just want to show you on this podcast why it is so important to talk about sex in positive terms and the way that God created us to enjoy it, that is intimate, pleasurable, mutual, honors both, is dignified, et cetera, et cetera. Because when we don't, then we get into a lot of problems. So let me let me read you this letter. She says, my husband and I just discovered your podcast and blog and we can't get enough of your material. I was molested as a young child by another female, which brought about a lot of issues with sexuality and gender confusion. God has done a tremendous healing work in my heart and mind and I am much closer to the beautiful woman he has created me to be. There is still more work to be done in embracing my womanhood, sexuality and body. And I just want to point out, we often forget about this, that women can be sexual abusers as well. Yeah. And that is the story that a lot of women carry and a lot of guys as well so let's just remember that abuse comes in all kinds of different forms yeah <laughs> and and we need to listen to our kids and give them the word so they can talk to us about it okay my husband and i met in a very fundamentalist denomination i won't name it to preserve her privacy which we left almost a year ago way to go Good find job. better denominations we did the iconic courtship where we barely were ever alone and we touched for the first time on our wedding rehearsal night when we held hands Oh, if we could go back and do some things differently. In a 24-hour period, we went from not touching at all to having sex. And the resource we used for educating ourselves was the book, The Act of Marriage, Face Palm. (laughs) With my history in that book, I've been pretty wrecked for our entire marriage. And I shared last week, I'll put a link in the comments on how that book affected me. I have felt like sex has been a duty and primarily for him to get his rocks off, which I know in my head is not the truth. For my sweet husband, it is how he feels the closest to me and he wants to express his deep love for me. But because I don't feel much during sex and I can't orgasm simultaneously, I have felt broken. Like there is something wrong with me. I want to take a time out here. The act of marriage very much stressed, and I didn't even mention this last week, but it very much stressed that the aim was simultaneous orgasm during intercourse. Yeah. And anything else was less than. Yeah. I really appreciate that the book stressed that women can and should orgasm. Um, It was one of the first books to do that. Yeah, that was good. So that was good. But this idea that the only correct way to orgasm is simultaneously. Yeah, is simultaneous during orgasm. I mean, you know what? It's if you want to aim for it, that's wonderful. 
Yeah, go we for talk, it. Do we whatever talk, you want. We talk about how to do that yeah. in the orgasm course, but it's not like that is the pinnacle that everybody has to live up to. No, and it's not even that the orgasm will feel better if it's simultaneous or that it is more holy or something. A lot yeah. of research has found that for women, you know, different kinds of orgasm other than intercourse is actually more pleasurable. Mm-hmm. So like you aren't missing out if you can't have simultaneous orgasms. You're really not. No. And yet the the book really did set it up that way. So again, Mm -hmm. she feels broken. This is self-fulfilling prophecy. She feels broken here. I will also say, this is a little bit different. I do think the idea of simultaneous orgasms is a very male-centric view of sex because Mm -hmm. it's this idea of at the height of your pleasure, you can force your wife to get to the same amount of pleasure at the same time versus just learning how to do things to her body that she enjoys. Like if you're always focusing on making sure that sex is entirely on the man's timeline, then Mm -hmm. simultaneous orgasm makes sense. When sex is supposed to be a little bit more mutual, where it's a give and take, where you go Mm -hmm. back and forth, simultaneous orgasm doesn't matter. Yeah. So I do think even the idea of simultaneous orgasm being so emphasized is actually very anti-woman sexuality. Yeah. I will say, just say. Okay. Personally, I don't really care how you orgasm. I as don't long care as she either. Does, but you know, I don't care either. But don't make her feel bad if she's yes. not on the man's timeline. Yes. That's all I'm exactly. saying. Because simultaneous orgasm is about the man's timeline, not mm-hmm. hers. Yeah. Very true. Okay. I have a super hard time just letting go and being fully present. I have trust and control issues, but mostly I feel pretty numb except for clitoral stimulation, and it take so much time to reach orgasm, which really isn't practical because I have kids and I'm tired enough as it is. Oh my goodness. (laughs) And another thing I'm insecure about is female ejaculation. Do you know much about this? It's happened to me numerous times. It's messy, which adds the impracticality and I don't understand it. My husband doesn't seem to mind and kind of seems impressed, (laughs) but it grosses me out and I'm always afraid it's going to happen. And if I feel it coming, I shut down instinctually. Mm. I really want us to have all that God has for us in our marriage because I want to be one of those super cute old couples, but it (laughs) seems like there's so much to overcome. All right. First of all, please see a licensed trauma therapist if you're having a lot of issues with the sexual abuse from your past. Even if you don't think you're having issues, Mm -hmm. if you haven't had trauma therapy before, please go. Um, Because that stuff really does affect you. Yeah. Um, I will say what she sounds like is our chapter four in The Great Sex Rescue. Chapter four was one chapter we were not expecting to write. Mm -hmm. We had the whole book planned out. Chapter four was not expected. And it came up because woman after woman after woman in our focus group said something so similar. And it's exactly what she said too, that she has a hard time relaxing. She has a hard time letting go of control. And because of that, she can't get aroused. She can't orgasm. And so she is orgasming. Right, but she has a difficult time. Yeah. In our chapter four, we took a look at why so many women do have a hard time and some of the beliefs that are correlated with that. And a a lot of people in our um, pre-order launch team have said that that is the chapter that has totally changed things for them. So I think hopefully reading through the book and just recognizing some of your negative beliefs will help and learning how you can relax. So I think seeking therapy, reading the book, understanding that it isn't necessarily how he's touching you that's the problem. You know, if you can't relax, it might actually be some of the things you're thinking about sex. And as you learn to communicate better, those will resolve Mm -hmm. a lot. As for the female ejaculation, a lot of people do. It's normal, not anything bad. And also a lot of women don't. And that doesn't mean you didn't orgasm. Yeah. A lot of porn features this. And and we want to be careful saying that. Because obviously for women like this, you don't want to be like, oh, it's, no, like there's nothing wrong with it. The same way that, you know, porn features women's orgasms. Women's orgasms are naturally good. Right. But a lot of porn can fake it too. Yeah, and there's and a lot of, the, and now what we're seeing is, is more and more pressure on women to yeah. achieve this. So, so don't feel any of that pressure if you're one of those women who hear stuff like this and you're like, well, I can't do that. That's fine. Doesn't mean that you're not enjoying sex. Doesn't mean you're not as sexual as someone who does. It's related more with certain types of orgasms. I think I've written about this before. I'll try to put the link in, but basically what I would say is just have towels underneath you and you're, don't worry about it. Just yep. have fun. It, it often feels really good. Women say that it makes the orgasm more intense so if it does happen that's wonderful and you don't need to feel like you've peed the bed or something no because i think that's the concern that a lot of people have but you can see how a lot of her issues are about self-fulfilling prophecies Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so she's thinking that things are supposed to look a certain way and because they don't she thinks she's broken And so when we can let go of those ideas and get back to what God really wanted, then it's like, we're going to find so much freedom. We're going to be able to relax. And that's just what we want. Yeah. And part of that, you know, is probably going back to step one and just getting used to it from the ground up, right? Like you went from not even touching except for holding hands to having sex within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Like give yourself a break, Mm -hmm. right? Like go back and just make out. 
it's just and we talk about that a lot in chapter four but like how do you how do you retrain your brain to get aroused when it was never given the chance to learn Mm -hmm. so and that's what happened right she was never given the chance to learn how to be aroused yep and so it's just been a bit of a struggle okay as we are ending this podcast someone has asked us to end with some positive stories because Mm -hmm. they find this really heavy so we have some positive stories to share with you yes this one is from a guy and he wrote in from facebook about a podcast about the men Uh, the methadone one the The methadone one yes and he says great podcast the hard wiring comes from the media and the entertainment industry not from man's nature after starting this journey a year and a half ago of following your teachings i understand myself more and my relationship with god and my wife my heart and mind are slowly being rewired to be hardwired to christ jesus and to be the man he wants me to be and in turn the man my wife wants me to be i'm not perfect yet and i fail at times (laughs) but it will soon be a habit a good habit I've been married for just over 30 years, and I'm now feeling more love and closeness than ever before. Thank you and your family for ministering to my heart. Yeah, and that hope is just what we want for marriages, Mm -hmm. right? Even if you've been married for 30 years, you can still make changes. Yep. And so I thought that was wonderful. And then this one came in on the blog this week. Do you want to read it? Okay, here's a comment from a woman on the blog. This sounds so similar to my story. I read The Act of Marriage before marrying my husband. I was a virgin, plus a load of other horrible books and had been under different teachings in the past. Gothard, Pearl, unfortunately, I knew the Pearls personally and their advice made everything so much worse. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Um, Doug Phillips, Josh Harris, all of whom teach that women don't have a say over their own bodies or that having a sex drive is sinful. I hated those messages every time I heard them, but thought I must have to squeeze myself into this mold to be a good Christian and ultimately a good wife. Fast forward to my own honeymoon. I had a high sex drive, by the way, but so many messed up opinions from others who just got in my head and ruined things. My husband is the sweetest and kindest, least pushy man. We took our time, but it was physically impossible for us to have the wedding night we dreamed of. I was in tears more than once during our honeymoon, feeling like such a failure. Thank God I found an incredible female doctor who knew exactly what was going on and showed me so much compassion. After two years of seeing several female doctors and one gynecologist nurse who had never even heard of vaginismus, she treated me like I was making it up, a physical therapist, and the most wonderful pelvic floor therapist, we were finally able to consummate our marriage two years after we were married talk about feeling like an utter disappointment my husband was such a champ through it all unbelievably patient anyway all that to say all of the things you've written about vaginismus and your own personal story have been such a huge source of comfort and knowledge to know i wasn't just some freak of nature your articles and books have helped me more than i could possibly convey yeah, so that's lovely. Sexual pain was one of the outcome variables in our survey. We really wanted to get to the bottom of what caused it, and I hope that we did so that we can help more women feel like you're not freaks and there is there is help. And, and so I'm glad she found me. Yeah, and not only that, we wanted to let women know that if you do experience sexual pain, there is hope, there is treatment, and this does not need to be a long-term struggle. Right. Okay, last happy thing. We've had so many great book reviews come in for The Great Sex Rescue. We have about almost 500 people in our launch team now, and they're all reading the book and starting to leave reviews on christianbooks.com and goodreads.com. Amazon, you can't review until it launches on March 2nd. And remember, if you want access to the book now and you've already pre-ordered it, you can join our launch team. Just send in your receipt. Again, we'll put the link. I just want to read you this one book review that came in. I have never heard sex in the context of a Christian marriage spoken about like this before. In pre-marriage counseling and couples small groups, I heard that sex is most important to your husband. It is your duty to be there for him. I felt like my pleasure was an afterthought, that if I didn't climax, it was okay because he needed that from me. I was afraid to refuse sex for fear that he would cheat or view porn. All of this pressure really killed my libido. The great sex rescue brings such a wave of needed validation that my pleasure is just as important as his. Also hearing that my potential lack of attention is never an excuse for infidelity. Mm -hmm. The authors do a fantastic job affirming that sex is about mutually connecting with your spouse physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It is not a one-way street for the husband's pleasure. The Great Sex Rescue is a wonderful resource for husbands and wives to read separately or together. I love the periodic check-ins that encourage the reader to pause and reflect on what they've just read. 10 out of 10 for offering hope, healing, and encouragement to those who read it. Seriously, if the typical evangelical approach to sex and marriage doesn't sit well with you grab this book you won't (laughs) regret it yeah and i honestly hope that after reading this book the typical evangelical approach to sex and marriage doesn't sit well with anyone anymore amen so thank you for joining us on another edition of the bear marriage podcast we will be back next week to debunk one final thing um, before our book launches which is so exciting insane to think about yes so thank you for joining us thank you for spreading that twitter thread that was amazing i appreciate all the support and together remember we really can change the evangelical conversation about sex